Lately, many fans have been yelling about Amazon's Rings of Power show. We've also been yelling about Star Wars and Star Trek, also Marvel, also DC, also Doctor Who. Besides, what for? Why are we yelling? Aren't we fans of these fantastical franchises? Yes, we are, but some of us are also getting tired of them. Not only other fans' toxicity, but also too much content, too many worldly agendas, and possibly too little time to deal with it all. But aren't Christians meant to deal with it all by engaging secular culture for God's glory and to build bridges with our neighbors? Well, we do believe this, yet we may also fall into franchise fatigue, and our next guest joins us to explore how Christians can best respond to secular fantastical stories, even when they, you know, go woke. Welcome anew to your favorite fantastical franchise, Fantastical Truth, the podcast from Lorehaven, where we explore fantastical stories for God's glory and apply their meanings to the real world that Jesus calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett, the publisher of Lorehaven and also the co-author of the nonfiction book about engaging popular culture called The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I'm tired of watching Marvel movies. There, I said it. It used to be a delight, Gasp. but now us. it's become no. a duty. It's it's really like a chore. And that's what we'll be discussing today in episode 101. Why have some Christians moved from engaging entertainment to franchise fatigue? And we'll be joined by Megan Basham. Yes, we're going to briefly talk about that Rings of Power series. Zach even gets into Wheel of Time and other franchise irritants. And we waited long enough, I think, to do a pop culture rant. I think 100 episodes is quite enough where we are as positive as possible about these great stories in fantastical genres, often, almost always, made by Christians, but occasionally straying into the secular territory. As we say in our conversation with Megan, though, we still love these stories. We're still big geeks. We're not going to turn into, you know, your bad fundamentalist grandpa podcast where all (laughs) he does is rant about big Hollywood and that den of sin and all of that. But it is high time, indeed, that Christians who understand the point of popular culture, according to God, our creator, uh, to also understand the idols that infect popular culture. And I, like you, Zach, getting a little tired of the superhero movies. I said it, too. Not just Marvel movies, though. Don't don't diss on Marvel. You know, they are often (laughs) still giving the people what they want. And I still like a lot of them. I liked Shang-Chi. I liked Spider-Man No Way Home. I didn't see Eternals. Nobody saw Eternals. I don't know what that was on about. And even though me, the DC Defender, right? You know, that's my part-time gig going on about the Snyderverse and all of that. Uh, I'm sick of DC, too. I do not like what they're doing with their characters. There is a show that must not be named on HBO Max that had two heroes, members of the Justice League, on there just recently, just doing stupid, stupid, flippant sex vulgar jokes at each other dropping f-bombs there's no point to it that's the kind of flippancy the kind of oversaturation and dumbness that i'm i'm frankly getting tired of and there rant over we'll try to be positive now (laughs) okay i gotta stop you about spider-man no way home because what was so telling to me were all the reactions from my friends and other comments i read online like it's not political there's no agenda it's just fun And I thought, wait a minute, how long has it been since that was just normal with Marvel movies? Like we just expected to have fun and now we have to qualify everything with, hey, it's not preachy. It's not cringy. I'm like, this feels like a weird reversal of how everyone talks about Christian movies. Except except I think the only preachy, cringy Marvel movie that a lot of fans at least applied those labels was Captain Marvel. And that was a few years ago. And I don't see a whole lot of movement on the sequel. Well, there's, there's been a couple of others maybe, but... I, I, let's just put it this way. The only Marvel movie I haven't seen has been Eternals and I will never see Eternals. Like I'm, I don't hate, I just, you're not going to miss anything. I, I just don't, I just halfway. don't, I just yeah. don't care. And, and I frankly, I can't keep up with everything. Oh, I did. Um, I did bail on the Falcon and the winter soldier. I just, something about yeah. it just didn't grab me. Right. There's, I mean, I, I don't even know how many Marvel TV shows there are. I've barely even scratched yeah. the surface. Well, there's too it's, many. And, and, and there's yeah. it, it, part of that is just oversaturation. Um, there's, only enough time <sighs> in a fan's day to keep up with all yeah. of this. A- and yet, like, I'm, I have very little interest in, like, the next Star Trek series. Like, trailers will come and go, and I barely even see them. Uh, there's a new Batman movie coming out. I was originally kind of interested in that, but too much bad blood between me and that studio. Like, some of these are really secular reasons, I gotta say. But as we talk about later, 
Uh, Christians do have a purpose in engaging culture, and I don't think that it's just about trying to start conversations with our neighbors about yeah. men in super tights. I think it is about <laughs> active glorification of God uh, and, and maintaining our popular culture pursuits uh, in light of that higher goal. Well, and more than just fatigue, it's the, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's kind of this moral duty to watch everything. And in more than just like being up to date on movies so I can talk to my neighbors, you know, getting serious for a second, I, I see so much of what's going on in not just Marvel, but in a lot of franchises as part of this greater cultural revolution that's happening. And, and by that, I'm actually referring specifically to China, China's history, which we'll talk about with Megan in a little bit. but. In China's cultural revolution, they deconstructed the four olds, ideas, culture, habits, and customs. And you see a lot of that going on nowadays. Now, okay, there's always bad things you got to get rid of. There's always ways you got to reform yourself and culture, but there are a lot of good things that are being thrown out in our culture. And that's being re represented in a lot of these films. And I'm just like, I don't want to be a collaborator with the cultural revolution is basically how I'm feeling right or, now. Or, or an enabler, an incidental yes. enabler who, who does, who only is so focused on, oh, well, this is good and true and beautiful. And then crickets when it comes time to talk about the idols or the false religious ideologies or the sexualityism tropes uh, that are being injected forcefully into stories. Like we've got to be wise when we engage these things yeah. as Christians. And yes, that means we do have to sound like your cranky uncle who never even bought a TV because it's so evil. Yeah. And I, you know, I can hear, you know, we have a, uh, a bit of a concession stand and I'll just give a quick early item in the concession stand, which is, uh, look, I, I think a lot of people are going to worry about becoming separatists. I honestly don't think that's really much of a concern. I, I think the bigger concern is, be, is, uh, syncretizing is syncretism and being kind of swallowed up by what a lot of this, uh, these franchises are pushing on us. So look, if that means I take a break, I, I don't think any of us are actually going to become separatists or anything like that. You know, I agree with that. And this is Lorehaven and a day ending in Y. So of course we must reference <laughs> C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. He offers the, no, it's actually from Screwtape Letters, uh, where Screwtape is observing uh, that people, just as a matter of being people and having our various people problems, uh, we tend to run to the side of the boat with fire extinguishers when there's a flood. Uh, we're constantly on guard against the problem of the previous generation, completely yes. blind to the problems of our own generation. And I agree, Zach, that among most Christians, among the majority of our culture, uh, the real threat is syncretism, trying to find a way to cram in these sex ideas, these identity ideas uh, into a faith where they do not belong. They are alien additives. They have nothing to do with the biblical worldview. Uh, they are in large doses poison and in minor doses uh, can be severely weakening to the integrity of gospel faith. Uh, before we get to that concession stand, though, I, I want to do one positive thing real quick. Zach, what is a good example of a non-Christian made, secular, popular cultural work that you have been enjoying apart from Wheel of Time? Okay, I'll tell you something I really have enjoyed, which is Lost in Space on Netflix. It's been pretty consistently good. It's funny. You know, it, it's about a family trying to get together. So I think overall the themes and the meaning of it are really good. Um, Parker Posey is just incredibly creepy and in, is this psychopathic Dr. Smith. I, I, I love slash hate her, <laughs> but um, it, there are so many good moments in that story that, yeah, there, there's some things that, again, they're part of this cultural revolution, maybe. Uh, but it's really in the background. I, I think that overall the emphasis of the show is so positive. And I, I just, I'm a sucker for sci-fi. You know, I probably give a lot of sci-fi a pass more than superhero stuff. If I'm being honest. I feel similarly about sci-fi. Uh, just this past couple of weeks or so, my wife and I have been playing through the newly released, uh, I don't want to say video game. I, I, I'm starting to call these things interactive cinematic adventures. It's called Horizon <laughs> Forbidden West. Uh, it is a, a sequel to a game from a few years ago called Horizon Zero Dawn. Just absolutely top tier storytelling and gameplay. Uh, the first game had, you know, some animation issues here and there. Uh, they seem to have completely fixed that for the second one. Uh, this is a post post dystopian game where Earth has been reduced to tribes uh, that wander the surface 
uh, building communities and or harvesting or fighting these animal like machines, you know, in the form of dinosaurs or squirrels or other creatures, you know, flying or landbound. And, you know, fighting the machines forms a lot of the gameplay, but you also have at its heart this amazing mystery of starring this woman named Aloy, who is an outcast and doesn't know where her parents are or who her mother is. And then it turns out that her origin is tied into the reason why the old ones died hundreds of years ago and left behind their crumbling skyscrapers and reduced Earth to this ruin. And at the end of Horizon Zero Dawn, it's just this this amazing science fiction, like super original take on the post dystopian and these notes of hope, very classic humanism there. Uh, and then the next one seems to just pick that up and like we're seeming to go maybe a little in the direction of space travel and all kinds of great stuff. And it's it's just it's wonderful. And it does remind me of why Christians do need to engage popular culture and see the truth and goodness and beauty in there, because I would not call this a Christian game, but there is so much virtue in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't even tag it with necessarily being woke, at least so far, not necessarily like unless you're going to yell at them for having diverse cast members. Um, this is a new generation of people with all kinds of, you know, different countries and different nationalities that have been redistributed among all these tribes across uh, the continent of North America. So you can't yell at them for that. You know, I think that would be silly. Uh, I don't get any worldly or woke ideas necessarily from the storyline either. It's just it's just good science fiction. Uh, and it's one example of the fact that God in his common grace has allowed people who do not believe in him to make great stories, even as he has also allowed other people, I think is a form of judgment, uh, to start making some very bad stories. And it takes wisdom and gentleness, but firmness uh, for Christians to sort bad story from good story, and particularly to determine which of these we have time for in our lives, given our primary callings to glorify him. That wasn't even a concession stand. Uh, let's run through this real quick before uh, Megan swoops into the studio. First of all, our guest, Megan Basham, does work for The Daily Wire. Just go to dailywire.com, find her link in the show notes. There she is. Daily Wire famously and infamously does conservative punditry. They are on the right, one could say. Uh, there are many bad ways you could interpret that. We don't interpret that in a bad way. I, I would call myself at least a, a cultural conservative. I think Zach would do the same. And occasionally we dip into these issues on Fantastical Truth, but we're not a political podcast. Uh, just some of these issues happen to overlap with the cultural engagement issue, which is what we do with attention to Christian made fantasy. But now it's easier for us to do this crossover because the Daily Wire is also doing movies. In fact, even after we planned this episode, they released a trailer for their first superhero ish movie called The Hyperions, uh, starring no, I Carrie will see Ellis. that. Yeah. yeah, that is interesting. Uh, it's got it's, it kind of reminds me of Brad Bird's live action movie Tomorrowland. Maybe it's just the little badges that they've got carrying around and this kind of this retro vibe. Uh, but I'm, I'm highly intrigued by that. And I, I hope that uh, many other viewers will as well. Uh, Megan also, in addition to our entertainment reporting, also writes on religious issues, uh, including just within the past uh, month or so, uh, she's been writing about controversial Christian leaders, uh, people who critique the church and maybe don't have the best take on what's wrong with the church these days. So she's going after that issue. Uh, we are watching, we're overall enjoying that. Uh, we'll include all the links in the show notes if you wish to go in that particular direction. Uh, we might dip into this topic a little bit as well, talking with her, at least uh, per the bigger issue of how Christians have, I think, sometimes naively tried to overpraise popular culture in the secular realm while reserving all their criticism for the church back home. Uh, this uh, show does form a bit of a spiritual sequel to our episode 88 uh, with Bethel McGrew. You can listen to that episode if you're uh, curious about why I use terms like positive world or neutral world or negative world. All, all of that work we've done in that episode linked in our show notes. Also, as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I literally co-wrote a book about engaging pop culture uh, to help your kids to build bridges to neighbor and for the glory of God and all that good stuff. I like that stuff. I do love the idea of engaging popular culture. I've not changed, but this also requires a recognition of the idolatry, the systemic bad worldview stuff that is happening in popular culture. That comes across as very negative to some people. And we've waited over 100 episodes before we risk uh, going a little more negative uh, focus for one episode about uh, secular made stories. And when you critique secular stories, that actually, Zach, I think that makes you have the appearance of evil to some people. 
Uh, there's this understanding that if you do something that appears to be evil, it is evil. And then people will back away and shun you as if you're committing some sin. It is not a sin to discern and critique stories made by Christians any more than it is to critique stories made by non-Christians. And Christians can be very naive about bad issues with our evangelical culture. But in response to this, I think some of us have become naive about the fact that our secular culture and many of its stories really are based on active rejection of Jesus. And for more on that, uh, you can go back just a few episodes to episode 98 with Thomas Umstead Jr. about the differences between Christian publishing markets for books as well as secular markets, which do have gatekeepers and tastemakers who want to keep the Christians out. It is the thing that happens. We've got to recognize that. We don't want to be sentimentalists about the world. Uh, any more than we would cover up the problems in culture made by Christians. Well, and you made a good point there. It's not that we have changed. It's that a lot of these stories and these industries have changed. And we have to recognize that, that we could be standing in the exact same spot and these you know, industries are moving way off the cliff. Zach, you've had issues with skunks in places in your house that they do not oh, belong. There are skunks in the walls of the church. Yes, yes, there are. Sometimes you got to tear out the walls of the church and get rid of the skunks, but there are also many skunks in the walls of the community center uh, or the movie studio in Hollywood or the government office in your town or your nation's capital. Uh, it's just going to happen. Sinners going to sin. Uh, churches are the only ones that have an answer to that sin, though. And then the secularists just kind of mitigate the sin because of God's image in them. Uh, we've got to discern which is which. And I think uh, Megan will help us do that. So let's go straight to our interview with her. Megan Basham has just alighted from the back of a massive fire breathing dragon. She is a Rotten Tomatoes approved critic and the entertainment reporter for the Daily Wire. In her previous role as an entertainment editor and podcast co-host for World Magazine, she interviewed numerous A-list celebrities. She has also written for the Wall Street Journal, National Review, and Town Hall. Her book, Beside Every Successful Man, was published by Random House. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is a fun conversation to have. Yeah, great to have you. You've been having a lot of fun conversations, uh, definitely more political in some <laughs> contexts, but I'm glad you are the entertainment reporter foremost. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, let's proceed straight to chapter one of this discussion. And this is the one where we get a little bit more positive just to make sure all of our listeners know, hey, we're not like your, your grandma's church back home, you know, where they're yelling at the theaters <laughs> and the pool halls and all those things. We do like popular culture. Obviously you do, Megan, or you wouldn't do your job. Let's just go over real quick. What is great about fantastical stories in the secular realm? And how did you discover these kinds of stories as well as biblical truth? Um, I mean, as far as, you know, discovering fantastical stories, I've just always loved them from a child, you know, uh, Narnia, Lord of the Rings, all of that as a kid. Um, but as far as how I made it a profession, it was it was really um, laziness, I guess. I was on the school newspaper in college, and you could get free tickets to go to the movies, or cheapness, I should say, not cheapness, not laziness. <laughs> but you could get free tickets to go to see these press screenings, but the the trick was you had to write a review if you took the passes. So um, a lot of times people would not take the passes, so I just started taking them so that I could have free tickets. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so then I started writing reviews based on them. Um, and that's how it started. And um, I don't know, I guess I just from the get go, my uh, college editor felt like I had a knack for pulling out bigger themes in my reviews rather than just, you know, the acting was good. The production values weren't quite up to snuff. And from there, I started doing it uh, freelance for National Review, um, some other outlets and till I ended up at World. Um, on a junket, I met a world editor and she said, I, I think we need um, some culture critics. So why don't you mm. reach out to our editor in chief? And I did that. And he really liked my writing and was uh, really supportive of it. And it just became a profession. I think that's where I first found your material was reading your movie reviews for World Magazine. Yeah. And that and, you know, and I always I, it, it wasn't, um, you know, I, I hear these interviews, these deep philosophical, intellectual uh, motivations. I'm like, I don't know. It was just very organic. I like doing it. When I watch the stories, I love talking about the big themes. I love talking about what is the worldview of this. It was just really natural. That's what my husband and I do after we see a movie. We, you know, talk about, mm -hmm. well, how, how does, what kind of world does this show us? What kind of um, values does it show us? How does it align with our outlook? Things like that. 
So what are some of the favorite movies you've reviewed for World? Oh, wow. That's really tough. Um, I did one that I'm really proud of where I compared Jason Bourne to Ethan Hunt and showed Mm. why Ethan Hunt is so much more morally superior, obviously, than James Bond, but also than Jason Bourne because he is serving a cause greater than himself. And Jason Bourne was this kind of new spy where it was self-serving and his entire journey is redeeming his own reputation or sort of solving problems, solving offenses that were committed against him. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about Ethan Hunt is I was like, this is a man who's all about the sacrifice and all about the mission. So that, uh, that's a review I liked. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense because Mission Impossible is all about the team and all about the goal they're accomplishing for the organization. Whereas Jason Bourne, it's all about identity, personal history, trauma, personal goals. It's very individualistic. Right. So, Yeah. Also, Ethan Hunt dangles from helicopters, and Jason Bourne does not. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> so Tom Cruise does have that uh, advantage. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, kind of at the back of this discussion is a rather simple assumption that, duh, people who are conservative, Christian, evangelical, whatever label you wish to affix, tend to be very nerdy. Uh, we were talking last year mm-hmm. with uh, Tim Chafee with Answers in Genesis, and like there are a bunch of nerds, as I always suspected, that work for Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum uh, Christians with conservative cultural beliefs like geeky stories. So that's just one of the assumptions that we make going into this discussion. Right? No, that's absolutely true. And I, it's funny because my husband, you know, he he does not obsess on fiction and storytelling the way I do. He enjoys some things, but he's like, I don't totally get you guys who <laughs> are that way. <laughs> um, and it's cute to watch. Yeah, my kids are now that way too. <laughs> well, it's always awkward when you're in a group of people, you're like, hey, did you guys see that movie? You see that show, and they're like, "What? I, you mean the football game?" And it's like, "Oh, right. okay, we're we're in different worlds here, you know." So, or it's the folks who turn on the TV just to see what's on, rather than know what exactly is releasing on what day, and make sure that you clear the schedule in order to be there <laughs> uh, with your phone standing by, so you can live tweet through the whole thing. There are right. two different levels of engagement there, and one of the levels that Christians have uh, enjoyed in engaging the uh, popular culture around us uh, is engaging it as a, as more of a neutral vantage. Uh, a lot of uh, Christian authors uh, within the last generation or two uh, have erred on the side of, well, let's, let's find the truth and goodness and beauty in culture. And there are even some Christian review websites that will go more in that direction. Uh, and today, uh, you will notice that there are some evangelical leaders, uh, some of whom have appeared in your work, Megan, uh, who seem to do that with secular culture, but seem not to have any eye for the goodness and truth and beauty in particular right-wing subcultures. But that's beside the point. Mm. Um, I've written on this myself uh, because I used to do uh, movie reviews for Christ and pop culture uh, and several other outlets. And I still believe this approach, uh, that Christians are called to engage the world around us. Yet I think I have a motive that is different from some other Christian writers who do this on the side Uh, more as an act of public witness. You know, you've heard this expression, well, Christians need to do whatever we can to maintain our public witness, you know, make sure that the neighbors know we love Jesus. I don't engage movies primarily as an act of public witness, so I could Mm -hmm. then talk about Jesus with my neighbors. I want to engage these stories when I do for the more vertical directed glorification of God. I, I think that's a more biblical defense of why we engage with stories and culture glorifying God, worshiping God, not just in order to help people. I think the helping people, the evangelism is important, but it's also a secondary goal. Um, Real quick, I think that's just what makes me uh, affirm some Christian engagement of culture strategies, but also reject others. Uh, When uh, my co-authors and I were working on the pop culture parent, uh, I kind of struggled with this, actually. Uh, My co-author, Ted, I had to get after me for writing a chapter about Star Wars, The Force Awakens. And Ted rightly said, hey, your first draft of this is like way too positive. Like there are also idols in every single story. We've got to point those out. And that's kind of what we're going to do throughout this discussion is pointing out a rather creeping systemic idolatry that's going Mm. on in stories that threatens to lead us to this kind of franchise fatigue. And I think Christians need to be aware of that. We need to point that out, uh, even as we continue to praise the common graces that God has put into man-made stories. No, I love that. And um, it's funny, I hadn't really thought about it, but as you were saying that, I started thinking about one of my favorite pastors to listen to. I, you know, he, He's who I put on in the car when I'm taking the girls to school, and 
is Alistair Begg. And one of the things I've always loved about him is how he pulls out these little bits of pop culture for him, usually in music lyrics. But it will be he loves you know, some the Beatles. Ro- he does. Yes. He loves the Beatles, but he does it with the Rolling Stones or, you know, a lot of the pop music from his era. But he uses it to point out biblical truth or to, fi- to point out how um, these lyrics don't align with biblical truth. But the point, as you said, has really nothing to do with witnessing or, hey, I want to be able to engage with non-Christians. It's really just through these pop culture lyrics, I'm thinking about what is what does the word tell me and how do I relate to the world and how do I glorify God when I think about these pop culture lyrics? And I love that. And I hadn't really considered it until you just said it. <laughs> well, speaking of fantastical stories that require some extra discernment, you may be highly intrigued by our next book quest selection for the Lorehaven Guild at Lorehaven. Uh, that is our exclusive uh, Discord community server. Uh, invite only. Subscribe to Lorehaven for free. We will send you that secret access code. Our next selection is The Seventh Son, uh, the YA novel set in a Mesoamerican-inspired fantastic world uh, by author Lonnie Forbes. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, Lonnie unfortunately has passed away after a battle with stage four cancer. Uh, She died early in February, and yet her legacy lives on with her Age of the Seventh Son series. I already had my eye on this book uh, to put that into the rotation for book quests at the Lorehaven Guild. And right now with the release of her third volume, The Obsidian Butterfly, which just released in February of 2022, it seemed like a great time to go to The Seventh Sun. This book quest is recommended for readers age 16 and older. And for parents who may be listening, you may want to be aware this book does contain what we would call a couple of episodes ago with Parker J. Cole, uh, some sensual scenes. Uh, there is a, uh, as a hot prince who runs the uh, Chicome Empire, uh, and he is in want of a bride, and there are many princesses showing up, uh, prying him with their wiles. Of course, uh, only our heroine manages uh, to get through eventually. Spoiler alert! Uh, but also, there is some elemental magic, and uh, the sun is about to die on this empire because it's also a world where a various pantheon of gods uh, does exist. So reader discernment is advised but i think this is a fantastic story about law versus grace you can get the review of the seventh son at lorehaven we will include those links in our show notes uh, as well as the link to the book quest and more information about how you join the lorehaven guild to participate in our seventh son book quest starting on tuesday today the episode release date for this episode march the first exactly pastor Begg. I, i like where when he chooses to engage with you know more uh, favorite popular culture around Lorehaven, uh, such as Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, uh, he understands, you know, he speaks the Tolkienese uh, fluently, uh, perhaps a yeah. little bit more fluently uh, than certain Amazon showrunners we might mention. <laughs> and that's where we go into chapter two, uh, which is not just about the rings of power, which, by the way, I just noticed earlier when I was typing it, T-R-O-P is the abbreviation there. It's one letter away from trope. Trope. (laughs) Trope, yes. We just need to find something that that E stands for. Entertainment, for example. Many fans are increasingly annoyed by this show. Uh, The promotional posters, the stuff that the showrunners are talking about with Vanity Fair, uh, as well as the uh, teaser that just released uh, for the, uh, the big game. Uh, There are some dumb reasons for people to get annoyed with this, but also there are some legitimate reasons And it leads to my question here. Why are many fans getting annoyed by fantastical franchises? And I guess I just want to throw this out there. Megan and Zach, I am getting tired of superhero movies. I'm Mm. getting really, really tired of them, even while I am trying to like them. And I would like to send this comment back in time to myself by five years and say, (laughs) hey, Stephen, guess what? Near 2022, you are going to be sick of superhero movies. You're going to try to enjoy them. But there's just something going on all over the place, some drama going on. You know, Marvel is threatening, if you could call it a threat, to you know, make their movies more progressive. And, you know, and then you get Captain Marvel, who doesn't seem to have a story arc to speak of. Uh, and then over on the DC side, did e- either of you all happen to see uh, yesterday, there is a season finale to a show that must not be named. It aired on HBO Max. It's directed by James Gunn who did the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and he had a cameo from the Justice League, including Aquaman and The Flash, just making gross F-bomb jokes at each other. These 
heroes. And I'm a big Zack Snyder's Justice League fan. I joined the <laughs> fan, fan no. movement, all that. I know, right? Uh, I'm on Surprise. brand here. But it's not just the fact, oh, no, you know, Snyder would have never done that. It's like you're disrespecting these characters for unfunny, vulgar jokes. And mm-hmm. he's got, you know, he's got this, oh, you know, suddenly a character is bisexual and all this stuff in there. That's what makes me increasingly sick of these superhero movies on top of the fact that there's just too much to keep up with. And I'm getting a little tired of it. And I'm just wondering what either of y'all think about that. I mean, I've been there for a while as a film okay. critic. I got, I'm just catching up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, just because partly you're like, I'm just so sick of writing about superhero movies. Cause for a while it felt like that was all I did. If you know, cause, and it was one thing when you had a few a year and they were exciting, but then it was, it felt like all you got all the time. And, uh, and I'm a Marvel fan. I enjoy, oh, I enjoyed, you know, I haven't really enjoyed the last few. I liked Spider-Man, but that was, I think, more because of Sony. Yeah. So I kind of been sick of him just because it used to be a treat, right? A few times a year. And now it's like, you've got the Disney series and you've got one after another of these movies coming out and you've got multiple streaming platforms competing with their superheroes. So maybe I'm just like, I don't know, I'm, I'm missing stories about regular people. <laughs> Well, it's also, it's, it's more than just like too much of a good thing. The the content is being churned out by some algorithm. It seems like mm. it's like, Oh, you like this. You might also like this and this and this and this. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's the, in Wreck-It Ralph where there's the, uh, I, I can only think in movie analogies, but in Wreck-It Ralph where there's the game, it's like pancake or milkshake. And it's just like feeding the bunny like over and over again with the pancakes. And it's just like, it's too much. It's not like everyone's begging for these movies. It's, it's very clearly becoming this industrialized form. And, you know, you've written though about another influence behind all this, which is, which is China's influence uh, behind a lot of movies. And uh, can you, can you talk about that just briefly and, and how that sort of changed the, maybe the pacing or the, some of the dynamics of these stories? Well, and I'll also say you did not know that you were about to give me a plug opportunity, but since you did, <laughs> okay. I will say uh, the Daily Wire has um, a series that just uh, premiered called The Enemy Within that uh, is delves into China's influence in Hollywood and in media and in universities. Part of what is happening with China, I think if you broaden the picture too, is this whole intellectual property idea in that they don't want to do anything risky. So you always want to come in with a built-in fan base. And that's part of the frustration because I go, if it were some sort of superhero thing or some sort of fantastical storytelling that was truly original and unique, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm sick of fantasy as a basis for storytelling and film and entertainment. I don't think that's it at all. I think it's that they just keep retelling stories I already know. And as you said, telling them in a very manufactured way. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, when you look at China, I feel like it's part of that intellectual property issue in that they go, we want to guarantee that we will have blockbuster success with every movie. And China is now such a big piece of that puzzle because they are the largest film market in the world now. Um, though I do think this, I think that that dynamic is going to start shifting with China because suddenly they are not as open to our movies as they used to be. And you have right. seen the most recent Marvels not getting releases yeah, there. Shang-Chi didn't get a release there. No. And it was like made that in was part really for the Chinese market yeah. with Chinese or China-born stars. That was very right. surprising. So, and I, you know, I'd have to double check this in my notes, but the last time I checked, I'm like, I, I don't think any of the most recent, maybe four or five Marvels have gotten Chinese releases. So that is scaring Hollywood to death. And they're suddenly having to rethink their business model. Okay, what do we do if we don't have access to China? Now, then you had Spider-Man who did phenomenal without 1. China. 1.7 billion last I checked. Without, yes. wow. And I kept wanting to emphasize to everybody. I'm like, yeah, Avengers and all those, you know, they did amazing as well. But they had China without the world's largest film market. That's incredible. Such is the power of my OG Spider-Man, the right? superhero who saved my marriage before it even got started, Toby Maguire. Bully Maguire, all the memes, whatever you want to talk about him. Uh, <laughs> I still love that guy, and I'm fond of Andrew Garfield as well. And Tom Holland, the actor, not the historian, he's good too. Uh, <laughs> but I was thrilled to see Toby come up on the screen. And uh, oddly enough, I've only seen the movie once, but I'm really looking forward to owning that on the home release. Well, and that movie you went, we talked about, you know, the agenda grinding, and that is kind of part of the issue, I think, of what has happened with the superhero movies is that you also go, we need to teach our troglodyte 
audience a lesson in being um, more accepting, being more progressive. And I was really interested in Marvel films when I felt like they were examining interesting socio-political questions. So it's not like I'm opposed to that in in my superhero stories. I actually like it. I, I think it was part of what I really loved about Guardians of the Galaxy when it first came out was you had this really fascinating question of a pluralistic society dealing with um, a stringent religion that was almost Islamic, you felt like, the way it was portrayed and its extreme legalism and rule keeping. Um, and so it, that was fascinating, right? And then you brought up Stephen, Mar- uh, Captain Marvel that had not, I mean, it was just girl power. That was it. That 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 was the message. And I'm like, that was a big that's, idea. And they yeah, played their 90s girl power music. And there you go. I'm, I'm yeah. the <laughs> You are enough. It didn't, yeah. right. It, it, and here was why. It didn't give the opposing point of view uh, a chance to really flesh out, okay, what would their argument be? Or if you right. look at Black Panther, you go, both sides had, the villain had a decent argument oh, and yeah. that made yeah, it yeah. interesting. Yeah. Whereas you're like, what is the argument against Captain Marvel? Well, Black Panther, you know, it, it really seems centered on a debate, the debate between MLK and Malcolm X. So mm, there was a yes. lot of historical significance to it. But yeah, a lot of the newer stuff just seems like it's based on Twitter arguments. <laughs> and, right. And, and so, that's the depth, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it, it's their attempt to engage with those kinds of themes. I mean, that's the reason why fans are getting annoyed by these franchises. I mean, we mentioned the oversaturation. We mentioned the unoriginality, uh, which, by the way, is what ruined the Justice League theatrical edition in 2017, as opposed to the fully original, uh, earnest, uh, meta-human take of the four-hour version that released last year. But the the other big issue there is just I mean let's just go on come on out and say it it's it's the wokeness it's the secular religious worldview that is being artificially injected like a growth hormone into these movies uh, not to make China happy but to uh, raise the value of these movies uh, in the eyes of current moral currency holders uh, I was saying earlier like it's almost like there's an alternative currency out there. Uh, they don't care then about the slogan, well, you go woke, you go broke. You know, it's not always true, for example, but also, well, okay, fine. I lose my American dollars, but hey, I, I got me some woke points. Uh, and that's uh, also exchangeable for the valuable set of luggage behind door number three. Um, I'm not sure then that they really care much for what the regular people, uh, fans think about the movie, so long as they get their points with the high priests of the new sexual revolution religion. What's frustrating, too, is what that does to the quality of it. Um, I was talking with somebody recently, and I just said, you know, in a weird way, as a Christian critic, I see what's happening here, because you guys are forcing messages onto these stories instead of letting them develop out of the characterization, letting we them- We know that feel. Yep. Right. And so you go, <laughs> you're, you're putting your own, it's a different kind of religion and a different kind of gospel, but you're like, no, 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 we got to have an altar call. At the end of this, it's a woke progressive altar call, but you're forcing these altar calls and they feel unnatural. They don't feel authentic. And you watch it and you go, this just feels false. And it's fascinating to go. I'm even hearing from people who are personally, politically on the left going, yeah, we don't really like it either, which is kind of like all the Christians who used to go, gosh, why can't we just get a little better at storytelling? And on the quiet, you would admit that they weren't some of these films and stories. You wish they were good, but they weren't that good. I'm hearing that now from leftist friends. Well, that's good to know. And what's funny to me is how some of this stuff starts to self-implode. So China, you know, a lot of movies are changed to make China happy. Like, um, I think the famous example a lot of people are talking about is in Doctor Strange. There is the uh, the ancient one was supposed to be this Tibetan monk. And of course, that's controversial. Right. And so they had <laughs> Tilda Swinton instead. And I don't mind having the White Witch as a good gal for a change. <laughs> but, but there's also the the Taiwan right. flag on Tom Cruise's fighter pilot jacket. Oh, you know, right. that's being infamously removed yeah. from a Top Gun sequel. Yeah, or Re- Red Dawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, several years ago, the remake of Red Dawn, it was changed to North Korea. So there's those changes. But then there's other changes that actually, you know, how, uh, China wants the progressive stuff taken out. Uh, the, the most recent example I know of is Fight Club. The ending of that was changed instead oh, of the right. uh, instead of the but system being burned down. But they put it back. Did you but see that? They, yeah, oh, they, they, they put it back. back. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, that was like that was unheard of, though. That's kind of why I need to yeah. look into that about okay, how exactly? Because never does the CCP back down, and in this right. case, they did. So that's kind of wild. I guess Brad Pitt just you know trumps everything <laughs> somehow. Yeah, that um, it, it and and you watch that, you go. So they did that with Tilda Swinton, and then there was this argument of oh, it was whitewashing. And you're going, it wasn't whitewashing. Yeah. 
<laughs> it was the <laughs> fact that, yeah, they couldn't have a Tibetan character right. as a hero. Right. So that was really funny to watch um, sort of the, uh, yeah, woke backlash over, oh, well, you, you've now you erased a character of color. <laughs> On the flip side, Derrickson said it was also sort of um, a caricature with, he was afraid of that too. And that's weird to go. So now you're going to be afraid of having these minority characters because if you don't get it just right or leave it open to criticism, then you will be nailed for not having, I don't know, enough authenticity or you somehow caricaturized a minority character. And I, I keep wondering, like, what is the underlying motive behind all of this? Is it just moralizing? Is it just money? But I think a lot of it comes down to fear. Like, they are yeah. f- afraid. They are just afraid as anyone else is getting canceled, even though they have all this cultural power. But they are afraid of these different kinds of backlash, which would result in the loss of money. But but then there's a lot of choices. Yes, and Stephen, I know we can't rant all the whole episode about Wheel of Time, but there are so many weird choices that get made where it's like you're going to lose money and the audience and so that doesn't seem to be the, the motive b- behind this i i don't but you don't all, lose don't money though understand. you've exchanged yeah. it you've taken it to the cultural exchange and and then you you swap it out for a currency that they think is increasing in value which is the currency of the sexual revolution and identity politics yeah yeah, decades ago, uh, I, there was a, there was the Hayes Code, you know, the mm. the infamous Hayes oh, Code, yeah. you know, uh, enforced by the Catholic Church, kind of, you know, in Hollywood, and lots of people say, oh, that was a great thing because you got all these great movies. I actually, heard uh, your friend Megan uh, Andrew Clavin talking yeah, about that. Uh, the Michael other day. Knowles makes that argument too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe it was Michael. Code. Maybe it's Michael Knowles. Yeah. I heard from you know, you, you get them mixed up every once in a while. They are very prolific podcasters, mm-hmm. a lot of them. Uh, but now you kind of have this informal Hayes Code uh, going on, and I don't know. Mm what else you could call that that would rhyme with Hayes, but it's in effect and it's being enforced by a bunch of, you know, nonprofits and activists and advocacy groups out there, 501c3s with letterheads and fax machines and all of that. But they have the power because increasingly in our culture, and this is the thing that many evangelical leaders seem not to get, these folks are the ones with the power. Their cultural currency is increasing in value and everybody wants to trade in that. Uh, whereas some of the other currency that uh, used to be uh, the uh, the coin of the realm for a more Judeo-Christian world, uh, the the positive world that was more positive towards Judeo-Christian uh, expressions, uh, that currency is decreasing in value. And like I'm I'm not trying to go to the story personally, you know, to get preached at by either the Christians, even though I agree with them. Uh, or the sexual revolutionaries or the identitarians or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm not just going there just to be entertained. Like, I want a story that's going to show in a fantastical way uh, the human condition. You know, mm. I, I want real heroes who struggle. I want real villains who make a really good point. And it could be dangerous if you think about what they're saying too long. Like, those are the stories that I love because I think that I can glorify God the most and grow the most as a person by enjoying these stories. Uh, you put in some flawed, you know, cheap flattened version of a hero or some flippancy like james gunn does with his stuff increasingly uh that just does not appeal to me and so whether it's flippancy or just overexposure or the writing by committee thing Mm. um that's what makes me get franchise fatigue like uh, people rant for example about uh the um, the amazon middle earth show like oh well you know now you've got elves of color you know that's not what tolkien would have wanted like i'm agnostic about that I, i really stay out of that one uh, but uh, my wife and I both like we are annoyed because it sounds like the creators are trying really hard to say, well, these are the themes of Middle Earth, the big themes that you mentioned earlier, drawing out of the story. And it's just there's an uncanny valley effect. They don't seem to be tracking That's with exactly the themes it. that are organic to Tolkien's masterpiece that even uh, Sepita Jackson and his group seemed to understand. And you had posted earlier, uh, Megan, the uh, the repetition of the quote where. Uh, he and friend Walsh and Philippa Boyens, the writers of The Lord of the Rings, said we made a commitment to, as best we could, not to inject our own beliefs into this story. Well, and um, I'll I'll show off a little bit because I did say this on Twitter, though. I said Phil Jackson, not I was thinking Philippa, and I put Phil Jackson. Oh. And people <laughs> were like, wow, who knew that the great basketball coach? I'm like, I it, was, it, was a, it was another apostle Jackson. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just so you didn't say uh, Michael Jackson. But they, um, so, I mean, I was literally right out of college and, um, I got an invite to a a junket for uh, Lord of the Rings to go out and interview them. And Mm. it was funny because as a Christian critic, 
they were actually very open in these, you know, you have these round tables with, um, we were sort of the religious room and they would circulate. And so Philippa Boyens, Fran Walsh and Peter Jackson came in together. And when you ask them about some of the Catholic quotes that uh, Tolkien had, that he said, you know, I revise this. It was not a religious work originally, but in the revision, it became a very consciously Catholic work. When you asked them about that, they were super open to talking about it. And they were like, yes, we thought about that. We also thought, you know, about the impact of World War II and industrialization and how he felt about those things. So they were interested in what Tolkien thought about it, not what mm. they thought about it. Uh, right. And that I, I am not writing it off yet because, look, executives talk and they say a lot of stupid things <laughs> while they're promoting stuff. That is true. That is true. And they did get Howard Shore, the composer for the previous six Jackson Middle Earth films, which is a major get. Right. So I go, I don't know. what I, I, I have make it a rule that I don't judge the product until the product is out. So I am still reserving judgment. Um, that's a good, but that's I, a good point. Yeah, I think the sense people Great. Have, now I have conviction. Okay. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> fine. No, you're right. You're right. And I've felt that way about other movies before, and I don't want to be a crankcase about it. At the same time, Jackson himself threw his support behind the anime film uh, with Philippa Boyens co-writing called uh, The War of the Rohirrim, which is about uh, Helm Hammerand and the backstory of the Rohan kingdom, which I'm I'm looking forward to that more just based oh, yeah. on the little that they've said. But there's the thing. They've only said a little. You know, who knows? They could get infected, too, because the pressure is so on these folks to wokeify the story, you know, to, right. to, to fail to respect the past. But I, I'd like to think that there are still people out there who will respect the virtues of the past, even while challenging them with the stories of the present. But, and I also think we don't really think about, because they don't have, let's say, like a baptized ima imagination, they're not seeing what the appeal in some ways of Tolkien was. And they are going, okay, what was the last major, hugely successful fantasy series on television? It was Game of Thrones. So there's right. this feeling sometimes that, well, maybe we'll put a little bit of that edgy stuff in. And I don't know what they'll do. I, I mean, I, I read the stories about the casting calls for some sort of. I don't know what these people would Intimacy director. Yes, thank yeah. you. I'm like, what is the title? Intimacy oh, director. Intimacy who's coordinator, going, yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. who's going to oh, oversee some sort of sex scene. So I don't know what that's going to be, but you go, I mean, you're, it's alarming. It definitely doesn't yeah. make you feel confident that they get what Lord of the Rings is all about. But And, and to be fair, Jackson actually did it first, uh, with or without an intimacy coordinator in the extended version of The uh, the Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Uh, you see the dwarves skinny dipping in an elven fountain in Rivendell. And it's at a distance, but you can definitely tell uh, these dwarves ain't wearing their Weta Workshop <laughs> chainmail no more. And it's a bit scarring. Uh, I'd rather see a female dwarf without a beard uh, than a male dwarf without anything. But Jackson did it first. Now, you mentioned the bearded dwarf, the bearded female dwarf. So this is what I think is so funny. A, a lot of the conservative pushback against the trailers, uh, you know, about casting or whatever, they're also the same ones mad that the female dwarves don't have beards. So I'm like, wait a minute. These really conservative critics want a bearded woman, like in a in a film, and Amazon no, that is doesn't. A, that is a delicious like, irony. That is what funny. is happening. <laughs> I'm going to be I honest. I missed this broke. whole controversy. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, it's, well, a, it's probably a, better uh, that you did. Yeah. yeah. Well, we need to move on to chapter three anyway, and we've already kind of started to answer our own question here in, in the chapter three of to wrap this up. How can Christians respond to stories that preach these kinds of false religious ideas? Uh, the first answer we've been demonstrating it, even if not articulating it, is just engage the story. Try to be fair. Like, Megan, you're being fairer to uh, the uh, Middle Earth series than, than I'm being, <laughs> and I'm going to take that under advisement. Uh, the other thing I think uh, that we can do is is just laugh and have fun and not be grumpy about it. These are just yeah. stories. I mean, I, I don't like saying, oh, it's just a story. It can't hurt you. Stories have power. Story making is a gift of God, and therefore it bears the imprint of of his image you know the stories we make reflect our natures just like the people god makes reflect his nature uh those are better options and i think the bad options that we've seen from christians in the past have been you know well it's it's big hollywood it's corrupt you know let's avoid them let's shun them you know we treat that as if it's the spawn of the devil uh and you know stay yourself out of the pool hall in the theater and that's kind of the you know the og uh, fundamentalist response to that I don't think that's biblical. Uh, I think you you go back to Genesis and you see that God created people to make things using God's things. And we call that art and story and science and agriculture and all that good stuff. 
Uh, I've already alluded to the the other bad response, which is the, oh, let, let's just accept the stories. Uh, it's a good evangelism opportunity. You know, who cares if they ruined the Noah movie or the Moses movie with Christian Bale? Like, well, let's just start a conversation with our neighbors and only talk about the good stuff. Right. I call that sentimentalism, just like the Christian movies that you talked about, Megan, where you nerf the bad guys and you make it too easy to be a Christian in this G-rated world uh, that's already been cleaned up by somebody else. So Jesus has an easier time cleaning it up. <laughs> uh, I don't like that kind of sentimentalism. I think the better option is to engage these stories honestly with the goal of glorifying God. But also, and, and you mentioned just not having the time, Megan, because you had to write about all this stuff. It becomes a time management issue uh, yeah. for me as well. Like I, I don't have time to keep up with all those CW superhero shows, even if I liked them. Like I have bailed on so many shows and even several streaming platforms in the past few years. Um, I'm trying to read more books. I'm obviously busy with Lorehaven. I'm trying to make my own stuff, uh, which leads to I think the other yes, better option, which one. leads to what Daily Wire is doing. Yeah, we support, find and support excellent creative, truth based culture creation. There are many authors whom we review who are Christians who are doing that in the fantasy genres. And of course, there are some better Christian films going on out there. I saw yep. one uh, just announced today, actually, with Kelsey Grammer and um, uh, Jonathan Ralmi, who plays Jesus in The Chosen. They're making a, a movie about the Jesus movement. That sounds interesting. Mm. And uh, Kelsey Grammer is a professing believer as well. So that might be a fun one to follow. But let's talk real quick then about The Daily Wire, uh, which is also making movies. I mean, it's not just pundits with podcasts, but. They're also participating in this culture creation, which I was thrilled to find out about a couple of years ago. Uh, I know that Clavin has been um, on that uh, signaling a lot, and, and now it's happening. Uh, they've made two movies so far. We've well, actually released a previous uh, movie uh, called Run, Hide, Fight, um, R-rated uh, action thriller in a high school under siege, uh, and then Shut In just came out. Was it last week, I think, or last week or so? Yeah, that was also really good It was really such a blur. One. Yeah, we were all hands on deck for yeah, getting shut in out. So. Yeah. Well, it was now a great movie. Th yeah, it, it was good. And then, I mean, it, it's, I'm in the middle of it. And this is not, you know, this is not a pure flicks, although that's pretty funny because no. pure flicks just made Redeeming Love, right? And that's got naked people in it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then they made the, um, the Planned Parenthood movie, which had, you know, a live uh, seeming abortion on screen. So even pure flicks is pushing the boundaries. Shut in pushes some boundaries, at least for what Christians may be used to. But I would call that a Christian movie. Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, the director's yeah, a professing I mean, it's Christian. Not overt, but yes. Well, there's some moments. Uh, okay. No, you say it's not overt. Okay. From the first frame, you see the apple with the worm. And I'm well, like, well, symbolically, I see what you did there. right. But it doesn't have a moment where she goes, I chose, you know, where she makes it the little yes. speech. I chose not to do these drugs. Thank you, Lord. For I mean, yes. you know, it, she oh, does Jesus, what we you do know in real I'm life. stuck in this pantry. You know right. that I need to get out. Like all the things that we just saw over the right. last 45 minutes. Now spoon she fed back to us. She didn't do that. So, but you see it working on her as she, you know, just you see in her acting, you see her, her processing yes. it the way you would as a normal person and not yes. someone um, giving a speech in a pantry. Yes. Yeah. And let's just say that by the end, uh, the bad guys have also not gotten saved, you know, just before they get destroyed. Uh, right. The infamous ending of the first God Not God's Not yeah, Dead God's movie. Not dead, yeah. Well, it's funny. Well, we started putting together this podcast even before their surprise, a Daily Wire surprise announcement of their first fantastical genre movie, uh, which is a, what was it? Shapiro called it an anti-superhero movie called The Hyperions. And the, the headliner actor there is uh, Carrie Elwes, of course, uh, who played uh, Wesley from uh, The Princess Bride. It's funny, by the way, their podcasters like pronounce his names two different times. So I wanted to, uh, two different ways. So I wanted <laughs> to go and confirm it's Carrie Elwes is how you say that. Uh, Carrie Elwes. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So yeah, you you mentioned that like, oh, I, I missed I miss that one. And, like, I bet it'd be funny if it was sci-fi though. And then I, uh, and then I go look at the trailer and like, Oh, it's superheroes. Seriously. That's but great. I'm excited about this one because it does look different. And um, it, does look, it looks a little it. Tomorrowland. Actually, it looks a little like Brad Bird's Tomorrowland. Well, Maybe it's the badges I, that do that. I like kind of the mid century. It just, um, it's visually, set in the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. It's got kind of this cool. A lot of people were saying Wes Anderson looking vibe. So I like the fact that, um, even from, you know, an art direction, costuming kind of, place it looks different it looks cool it doesn't look like it doesn't look like something that just came off the conveyor belt so look i've not seen it so let me be very clear but the trailer was really exciting to me it was i, I mean i like the thrillers that i i am a genre I, i'm i'm a fantasy geek i like that kind of stuff so 
I like the thrillers, but this one, I was like, okay, I'm so excited for this. I, I think don't it has know. a potential to have a little bit more mainstream appeal. I, I yeah. forgot to check and see what it's rated, but at least the trailer seemed to be like, oh, you know, maybe you could take your teenager to it. You know, I mean, depending on the teenager, you might go watch Shut In as well, uh, but that, that's where the discernment comes in. You right. Know? Not just counting cuss words, but saying, okay, here's what we're going to see. You know, here's the kind of story. If you're sensitive to this, then you need to avoid, you know, because we don't want to get, you know, franchise fatigue uh, with that either. And it's different. So I'm excited about that, that I go, it feels like uh, it's different for us. We've done, you know, several thrillers. We've got a Western coming out. Gina Carano. Uh, yes. Yes. I got to visit the set for that one. And I do love Western. So I'm excited for that. And Nick Searcy, I got to kind of stand off to the side and watch him film some scenes. And um, I, I mean, watching him portray this bad guy, I was mm. like chills. <laughs> he mm. was so good. Well, I, I love this whole new emphasis from Daily Wire, but I'll, I, I did listen to the podcast and they said, hey, this is something we've wanted to do from the beginning. Like we even wanted to do this before starting the Daily Wire. And I thought, wow, that that is, you know, wh- what a great vision to create That's wise. art, yeah. you know, and, and not just complain about the culture and, and but actually create more culture to, uh, and, and do it yourself and not just wait around for someone else to, to come rescue you. But right. say, hey, we're going to create this. Well, and I think, you know, two things to keep in mind is that um, Ben Shapiro, his mentor for a time, was the famous Andrew Breitbart, whose mantra was that politics is downstream from culture. So there was always an understanding that, look, the storytelling impacts people first. That sort of, not right. that, you know, it's always clean, but in a lot of ways, how we shape our imagination is how we shape ourselves morally. And how we shape our principles and values. And so I think there was a recognition of that. And then there was also the fact that our CEO, Jeremy Boring, he's just kind of a Hollywood guy. He had a Hollywood background. So um, I think he always loved entertainment. So I I don't think it's just purely strategic. I think he's just a guy who really, really likes movies and likes entertainment and um, also saw the need to go, look, it's terrible that there's a huge amount of scripts that don't get made. There are a huge amount of filmmakers who aren't getting hired because they don't check the right boxes these days. So there needs to be a place to, um, you know, for them to bring their talent and their skill and their creativity. So I'm excited about that. Well, and even that shut in had, you know, Steven, I won't spoil it because you you said, I think you said you're in the middle of it and some others haven't seen it. No, I finished. I finished. uh, I'm good. Okay. Spoil it for everyone else. I'm good. All right. (laughs) So, uh, well, I'll just say there were some symbols of Christianity. There was a crucifix, there was a Bible. And honestly, I just kept waiting for the gut punch that I've come to expect from so many mainstream Hollywood movies. Like, oh, this, I I think I see how this crucifix is going to get used or what's going to happen with the Bible. And I just, it's like, I have this little, um, I just had, just had this expectation in my head uh, and it never went there. Like that both of those objects and really the overall point of you know her uh, her mother's faith it became a very positive thing and, and it overall is a very redemptive story um but i you know it, it was really refreshing to not just get slapped in the face by someone's angst against what stephen calls the church back home or you know just right or just the general deconstruction of everything that we're we're going through and you know it it was like so christian in that way and it's uh it was very surprising so kudos well thanks i'll i'll just take that uh kudos for the whole <laughs> yeah, team thank, good, great, <laughs> kudos great, to daily wire great directing just, job yeah thank great you i just showed wonderful. up at the end <laughs> great and performance kind of, <laughs> yeah, did a well, few you get interviews to report, but <laughs> you, you get to report on this entertainment and for me i mean I'm, i will out myself i as i said i've listened to the daily wire podcast host for a while and as we draw to a close i one of the main reasons why i was drawn into this group is not just because i like you know rabid you know really really intense you know conservative right-wing talk radio or something although i have grown up with that in my background but i also appreciated uh, the emphasis that shapiro and others have on the storytelling Um, when i heard them talk about hollywood movies like they knew what they're talking about that you know shapiro could talk about superhero movies you know fluently Um, they, they do of course the youtube videos where he reviews movies and stuff But he knew what he was talking about. And several conservative talk radio hosts I grew up with did not, uh, you know, God God rest Rush Limbaugh, uh, who uh, died about a year ago at about this time. But I still remember in 2012 when The Dark Knight Rises was about to come out and Rush went off into this big conspiracy theories about how Bane, the the villain from that movie, uh, was actually based on Bane Capital, you know, a group that Mitt Romney had consulted for. And it was (laughs) like suddenly in the movie. And I'm like, 
all due respect to Rush Limbaugh, but like this movie would have been written, you know, and filmed years before. And the character was made up in the eighties and just a little research would have borne that out. And, and I'm that, glad and that that's, they were so conservative as far as the outlook. Oh, the, the movie, of Christopher that. Nolan. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it almost jumps the shark a little bit because there's a scene where, you know, the, the Bane's coming into the Gotham City stock market and they're saying, well, what's the big deal? And then someone says, well, you, you can't ruin the stock market and here's why. And like, oh, thanks for that little economic lesson there, right? writer. You know, like <laughs> I agree with you, but it almost stopped the story cold to explain that. But uh, conservatives need to be making better stories. I'm glad that Daily Wire is doing that. I think that Christians need to see the audience that Daily Wire is reaching as the new neutral space to engage. Mm, it's not that, that everyone here is a Christian. You know, there's different religions even among the Daily Wire hosts and the writers. You know, there's definitely Christian friendly, but, you know, Shapiro's an Orthodox Jew and Michael Knowles and Matt Walsh are Catholics and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then uh, Clavin uh, considers himself an uh, evangelical Christian. So th there's room for all of these beliefs. That doesn't mean that this is a Christian market. It's Christian, but it is culturally conservative and it is i think a neutral space that can pre-baptize the imagination uh with that uh, with these virtues these truths and these stories that we feel at our hearts and then i think the christian can come in and say well, here's why we love these stories because they dimly echo the original story of jesus the true hero uh, and you can have those conversations with your unsaved friends you know but <laughs> you don't have to that's not the only reason to make right. and enjoy these stories you can enjoy them and make them uh, primarily for the glory of God, reflecting his image back to him in this kind of creativity. No, I love that. And, I, you know, I, as I've heard um, Jeremy and some others at the company a little higher up the food chain than me talking about the purpose of making this kind of entertainment, they have very specifically sort of laid out one of the ways you should think about these films is more about what's not there. So the gut punch is not going to be there. The, you know, really heavy agendas and. Um, pushing a certain point of view or trying to get a particular message out is not going to be there. That's actually, yes, we are a conservative media company, but that's not really what we're interested in doing. We're just interested in telling really good stories. Uh, so now as a Christian, I think if you tell really good stories, if you are, any good story has to be grounded in truth. So if you're doing that, it's going to be sort of reflective of a conservative yeah. worldview and a Christian worldview by nature. But, um, but the first order of business is let's just tell the best stories we can. Well, and I think, you know, going back to why even make stories, why enjoy stories, there's this verse in Acts, I think about all the time that God has not left himself without witness. And so uh, storytellers are using the world that God created. And so they're going to use tools and ideas th that ultimately will point back to him if there's any truth in it, like it's, it's his truth. Uh, and so I, I particularly love watching films that are, are secular or whatever and finding where there is truth is sometimes even to the, um, to the surprise of the filmmaker or to yeah. the surprise of the screenwriter. Like Stephen said, you know, we're, we're ultimately trying to glorify God with our lives. And so you can always find truth and thank God for the truth that, that things show. Megan, it's been great to explore all of this with you. I hope we can do it again sometime. Uh, you know, Christians are in the business of reconstruction. Jesus does not deconstruct reality with his heroic narrative. He reconstructs it. He will not consign his universe to obliteration. He's going to make it new. And I like the idea of Christians and friendly allies who are not Christians, but who do share our beliefs in some ways. I love the idea of us getting together, not in church, but in the studios to make stories that one way or another, apart from our intent or by our intent, will glorify God. Uh, we don't do deconstruction, we do reconstruction. And you get to track all of this from the inside as the entertainment reporter at Daily Wire and part-time religion reporter, apparently. <laughs> Where can people follow your work at this uh, publication? Yeah, so I mean, if you just, if you go to the Daily Wire, you'll see my reports there. And any report that has my name on it, you click on it and you know there'll just be a whole list of Megan Basham and you can also find me once a month now on the Andrew Claven show, which is really exciting. And you can find me several times a week on our Morning Wire podcast, which is uh, just a straight 15 minute news podcast. It's not opinion, it's just going to give you the news of the day. Um, so uh, I really enjoy doing that. And I would recommend checking it out because it's a new product. And if you're into the whole Twitter side of things, you can mix it up yes. like Megan does by following <laughs> Megan, which is how we got connected. See, Twitter, too, like popular culture, is not a complete sewage vat. You can find some fresh <laughs> yes. fruits 
floating around in there. <laughs> you can pick them out and they may even still be fresh. So uh, that's why we engage these kinds of cultures. So Megan, really appreciate it. Uh, Godspeed. And we wish you the best with your continued work at Daily Wire. Thanks so much. And to you too. Thanks, Megan. You know, Stephen, at the beginning of this episode, you mentioned the uh, the skunk fiasco that we we had and we're kind of still having. I think we've got rid of all, all of them. But, you know, unfortunately, the smell of the skunk is not totally gone away yet. So uh, that's uh, been a huge challenge for us. And I, I think it does kind of represent something that, that sometimes, like you said, critters fall, come into your walls and critters come into the walls of the movie theater or the government or the other businesses that you partake in. And that's just how it is. We live in a broken world. And so we don't expect non-Christians to make Christian movies or Christian books. We don't expect non-Christians to live like Christians. And so we're not just sitting in judgment over all non-Christians or, or their works. But what we're saying is we have to use discernment. And sometimes, yes, that means taking a break. Sometimes that means like, I, I got to figure out how these stories have influenced me and sort of clean up my own life. And, uh, and maybe deconstruct, uh, the bad ideas, the secular ideas that have gotten into my faith and not just deconstruct, uh, Christian culture or whatever, uh, because, you know, we are commanded to not be unequally yoked and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that that can apply. And I think a major way that applies is the ideas and stories that we let into our minds and into our families. If, if that's becoming too strong of an influence on us, we, we have to watch out because yes stories do have power. Zach agreed completely. You also mentioned at the top of the show that we have not changed in large regard. A lot of these uh, secular story corporations have changed, you know, putting these ideas by design and often at the behest of the new sexualityism high priests of our culture. Uh, these ideas are getting into the stories. You've got stories now that are trading in the currency of the moral betters uh, rather than, you know, actual American currency or the kind of stuff that you would pay to get food at the grocery store. Uh, this is happening. Uh, we have not changed. These stories have changed often. And yet at the same time, I do find that I think, speaking for myself, my pr approach has changed. Uh, back in the day, I used to write a lot more movie reviews about the superhero movies, uh, a lot of the stuff that I enjoyed and still enjoy to this day. But in terms of how I manage my time, I do find that after we started Lorehaven by that name in 2018, I want to focus more of my time on not deconstruction of the bad stories, but reconstruction of the good stories. I not only want to make my own stories, but to endorse the great stories that are out there. And that is what Lorehaven does with the reviews, uh, with all of our articles by several different amazing Christian storytellers and by the book quests that we're doing in the Lorehaven Guild. Uh, we don't even do bad reviews at Lorehaven. Uh, if we see a book that we don't like, that none of our review team members like, uh, we'll just sort of quietly give that a pass. Or maybe we just don't have time. So, you know, any authors, if we didn't review your book, it may not be because we thought it was bad. It may be just because other reason, who knows? Maybe, maybe it was just an older book, something like that. But whenever we find a great story, we want to bring that in front of fans, in front of Christians who are looking for great stories for their kids or for themselves. We would rather create culture than yell at the culture that we see. And that's why yes. I'm glad that's what the Daily Wire is doing, too, because a lot of people have this preconception, this bias uh, that all the, the rabid right wing podcasters do is yell at the secular culture. Uh, and I see some of that and, and among uh, conservative or Christian <laughs> old man pundits. yells at cloud, old man yells at, you know, leftist cloud. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that does happen. And I think there is a, a point to that. There is a place for that. But I think it ought to be our side quest. Our primary quest ought to be creating new stuff that is good and excellent. And I'm glad that the Daily Wire is pursuing that goal. Uh, that's partly why I became a subscriber, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, some of the some of the yelling, you know, punditry stuff to me, uh, that may come across as a bug, not a feature. Uh, I think it is a secondary feature. Uh, it's a side bonus. Uh, the the main feature of of the product of the message is going to be making more of these kinds of great stories not just for Christians or by Christians, but definitely for people who want to see good guys fighting bad guys uh, and then seeing the bad guys go down for redemptive reasons, stories that focus on the story, not on the agenda. Um, I don't even like that if I like the agenda. You know, as Megan mentioned about Christian movies, like it's so cringe even if you agree with that altar call. 
Uh, it just but comes it's across as so it's Christian. Yeah. But <laughs> if I don't like it when I agree with it, <laughs> how much less am I going to like it if it's an agenda that is completely contrary to reality, according right. to my Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, it's going to be cringe in triplicate. So I could go on about that. Uh, but we, we got to get to our comm station. I see some backed up messages over there, Zach. Actually, there's some flashing lights. Uh, since we moved the imagination station out of here, I think we may have blocked us some of the screens on our comm station. <laughs> yes, we got a note from Autumn who replied to our episode about uh, sensual scenes with Parker J. Cole. This was episode 99. And Autumn writes, quote, sex is an aspect of life that a lot of people struggle with, and it's made worse when people are not willing to talk about it honestly. Or when people do talk about it, they do so in a toxic manner. It's hard because although sex shouldn't be a completely taboo topic, that doesn't mean that people should sit there and marinate in sexual content either, especially not at a young age. Not nearly everyone needs to talk about sex or discuss it in their stories, but it's important that some people are willing to do so on occasion. End quote. And yes, you know, you know, you mentioned marinating and I'm just thinking, yes, you, you marinate something when you, you cook it under fire. And yes, this topic can very much be a fire, you know, and fire is a good thing when it's in a barbecue grill, when it's in a fireplace, uh, not when it's in your living room, just like on the couch. And so I like that imagery. And yes, you're right, Autumn. It, it has to be talked about. Hey, the Bible talks about it. It's not a taboo topic. It's how we talk about it. It's when we talk about it. It's uh, you know, it's who's listening in that conversation. Definitely. That makes a point and how age appropriate it is for sure. Um, so yes, I, I think that's, you know, you, you've hit on it exactly autumn. It's that this is a very delicate and difficult topic handle with care. Uh, you know, that that's, uh, that's the best thing I could, I could say about it. Zach, I wish you'd been able to join us for the discussion with Parker. I guess you were just too puritanical or maybe you just had to deal <laughs> with the skunks infesting your house. Yes. Uh, I do view some of the central content as the equivalent of a skunk in the house. I mean, someone may have a, a really finely tuned sense of smell and they can breathe that skunk musk and go, oh, yeah, yeah, we need some more of that stuff in here. Um, but it, I mean, there's some gentle disagreement between Parker and I. I think it came through in that episode, but we are still friends. We're still allies. We still love Jesus. My main point there is not so much nobody should read these kinds of sensual scenes ever. My main point is is more like the example of people rushing to the side of the boat that's already going underwater with fire extinguishers. Um, I do see some Christians who may have issues with the church back home, and I don't mean Parker, I just mean in general. Uh, uh, I see some Christians go, man, we need to talk more about sex around here. It's been entirely too suppressed. And I'm like... Dude, you are 5% of the world and 95% will not shut up about sex. Yeah. Do you they know the culture we live in right now? Come on. <laughs> just completely saturated in the stuff and it is not healthy the way that they're talking about it. You know, as if it's only meant for personal satisfaction and gratification uh, rather than a gift from God with certain parameters designed to make you happy by fulfilling your role as a man or woman in a committed relationship which includes reproduction. Like that's what the thing is for uh, along with the happiness and joy. And we're getting into PG-13 discussions here. Uh, my point is that even if we do have books with sensual scenes, uh, they're often being marketed to the very people who do not need that stuff. By that, I mean young adults or teenagers. Um, uh, particularly, uh, Marion Jacobs, our friend and author with Lorehaven, uh, has been aghast at so much of this toxic stuff uh, in fiction that is being directed to kids. And of course, even after Marion was talking about it more, uh, this stuff hit the big time because parents were going to their school board saying, what about is this pornography yeah. doing <laughs> on my shelf? Yeah. What, what, what is this yeah. doing in public schools? I mean, and we're not even talking about, you know, trans pornography or gay pornography, but, but even just, um, you know, good old fashioned male and female stuff. Like, I don't think that that belongs in the imagination of even a teenager who needs early on to understand the basis of why God has given us sex. Like, yeah. and a, particularly a female reader, I, I don't think it is healthy for most young female readers to be getting uh, these, these heavy makeout scenes or descriptions of reaction from the inside uh, in, in these books. I think that violates the Song of Solomon urging to not stir up or awaken love until it is ready. 
Uh, I think that is premature. And if not an issue of sin, it is an issue of absolute foolishness. Uh, Even for some Christian authors, I have noticed, and we want to be careful here and wise and caring and compassionate and all that, but some Christian fantasy authors are now putting some of these central scenes in their stories for the kids. Somebody was telling me about that not too long ago, like a heavy makeout scene and, you know, and, and, and there was descriptions of, ah, I don't even want to go into it, you know, and you can say like a former president, like, well, it doesn't count as sex because you know, this didn't happen. Like, yes, it does. It's on the spectrum. It's on the spectrum for that. You know, you're describing scenes of that kind of passion. Um, I, I could go on about that. The show isn't about that, but I think it is kind of about that because this stuff counts as a, as a skunk in the wall. Our metaphor holds. Uh, this stuff counts as, I think, <laughs> I hope a that secular metaphor additive. dies very soon. <laughs> well, and then the odor clears out after it. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can light some Yankee Ugh. candles in there or something. And then that's what we really want to do here. We don't just want to curse the darkness and say that the darkness stinks. We do want to light candles you know christ compares his people and their (laughs) offerings to a pleasing aroma we want ultimately at the end to connote a pleasing aroma of healthy stories even healthy sensual expressions in moderation and for god's glory and the benefit not the endorsement of the reader's lust we want to serve the reader and help point them to jesus and that that is parker's heart Uh, i have no doubt that is her intent in what she is writing i would just like more christian romance authors or Christian YA fantasy authors to be pursuing that uh, rather than buying into these ideas imported from the world uh, to endorse the reader's lust, essentially. Well, send your Febreze cans to our P.O. box or your skunk remediation tips to podcast at lorehaven.com. And really just your comments about that previous episode, this episode with Megan. Uh, We'd love to know what you are enjoying uh, that's like an alternative story, one of these smaller platforms that's making its own content or indie content, uh, whether it's books or, or music even. You know, music really started this whole indie artist revolution. So send us that note or tag us on social media. Just look for Lorehaven on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also go to our website and comment on the show notes for this episode, 101 as well as the show notes for episode 100 uh, with Phil Lawler, the founding father of Adventures and Odyssey. Zach, uh, we might just need to bring that Imagination Station still on loan to our Lorehaven Studios over to your house. I think it has its own olfactual controls for full immersion (laughs) in the imaginative experience in biblical times or American history, so that may help distract from uh, that skunk aroma, that unpleasing aroma as unto the devil, not the Lord. You can also, of course, join the Lorehaven Guild uh, just in time to join our book quest for The Seventh Son by Lonnie Forbes. That starts Tuesday, March the 1st. Release date for this episode. Just go to lorehaven.com slash subscribe. Enter your info. We will send you the super secret invitation code for the Lorehaven Guild. Next on Fantastical Truth, now that we have hit 100 episodes, we are going to time travel back to the top episodes of Fantastical Truth. From UFOs to understanding biblical imagination and the purpose thereof, to dragons versus televangelists and topics beyond, we will explore the big ideas that our listeners have loved and listened to the most and catch up with any updates to those stories. Meanwhile, whether or not you have a skunk in your house, uh, whether you have grown tired of superhero movies, or you've somehow managed to track with every single episode of every single DC derived show on the CW network, just make sure that you are managing your time, your fandoms, your discernment for the glory of God. These are not just stories, just entertainment. These are powerful tools that God has given humans to glorify him. That's what we hope to do by lighting candles instead of cursing the stinky darkness only as we continue to seek and find Christ's fantastical truth. 